Thanks again for joining everybody. This is Danny Zavala, your host on the Rec Center Podcast. Today, we got a special guest. Her name is Veronica Perez. I happen to know her. I happen to work with her at Wenatchee Valley College. She's amazing at what she does. We're going to be covering athletic training and hear her story. So today, we have Veronica Perez, a.k.a. V. How you doing? Good. How are you? Oh, doing really good. Slamming. Couldn't be better. Yep. V. And sometimes my really good friends call me Vettel. Vettel? Where does... Vettel. Vettel, the first... The first four letters of my name, Vettel. Oh, yeah. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> so, V, where are, you, where, are you, where are you at right now? So, right now, we're all remote. Are you here in Wenatchee? Are you back home? Yep, I'm here in Wenatchee. I live right down by the river, and I can see the sun poking through, and it feels like it's going to be a hot day already. So, I got the tropical theme to match it. I like it. I like the background. I actually wish I was in Hawaii right now. That would be awesome. Yes, that so, would. Elevator pitch. Tell us about you, Veronica, where you're from, where you went to high school, where you went to college. So I grew up in Mount Vernon, Washington, went to Mount Vernon High School, home of the Bulldogs. Um, from there, graduated in 06 and went to Central University in, in um, Ellensburg. Loved Ellensburg. Um, discovered athletic training there by way of you know, kind of exercise science, nutrition route, and discovered I needed a master's degree if I wanted to pursue athletic training seriously. So um, from Central, I went to California Baptist University in Riverside and, and got my master's in athletic training there. You know, and it's, it's amazing. So everybody who's listening right now, so Veronica, we had a, a pre-discussion during the pre-interview and we found out that we went to Central at the very same time. Like she went <laughs> in 2006, I went at 2008. So we must have collided somewhere within the student rec center, um, you know, maybe on campus somewhere, maybe in the football exercise. Football game. Football games. So pretty, pretty funny stuff. I didn't know that about you, but uh, we both came to the conclusion that we've probably seen each other on campus. Definitely. Uh, 10 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so crazy. So you went um you went over to California, California Baptist University in Riverside, California. What what made you go all the way to uh to Riverside, California for your masters? Yeah, so interesting thing about the athletic training profession. At the time in 2009, there were only 17 what they call entry level masters programs in the country. Wow. And it was California Baptist University and Montana State Billings that were the most Western programs. And I wasn't ready to go move to Texas or South Carolina or New York. You know, there are all these programs um, from the Midwest East, but I wanted to stay on the West Coast. And being in Ellensburg for four years, I didn't want to move to Montana. <laughs> So the Baptist school, not being Baptist was my only option, um, but it was also my first option. And I have a ton, all of my family lives in California. My parents are kind of defectors of California and moved to Washington before I was born. And so all of my cousins, aunts and uncles, and my, my one remaining grandparent lives in California. So it was an easy choice. Yeah. I mean, that makes it easier to go into college and having some family around you. So I like that choice. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now for athletic training, you have to get your master's degree and there are like over a hundred <laughs> programs everywhere in every state. So wow. there's no, no shortage now, but that was definitely a driving um, decision factor. And that, and that was only 10 years ago. So in 10 years, it went from 17 all the way to over a hundred. Mm -hmm. Wow. So it's definitely a time profession. Wow. That's, a, that's amazing. So you went over, you got your, you got your master's degree. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your job position at uh, WVC, your day-to-day, -day, what that looks like. Yeah, so athletic training encompasses a lot. I mean, it, it has five pillars, you know, that it stands on. But day-to-day, -day, what it looks like is you just caring for the student-athletes and, and where they're at in their season of competition whether they're preseason, in season or postseason. And 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 so day to day, hour by hour, it could go from treating, you know, preseason 
basketball players and what they're doing and it, kind of minor stuff maybe. And you then you're going to pre-practice taping for soccer players and volleyball players. And that can last anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours. And then post-practice yeah. treatments for them. You know, you find somewhere to eat something real quick. <laughs> you're filling the ice bath in the background. You're doing your, your paperwork and your documentation. And, and then, um, you know, the second half of the day, everyone comes back for their second round of either post-practice or, or second day treatment and, and or rehab exercises. And you just cycle through that. And once in a while, you hit a game day where it's a little bit calmer. You know, you're not having people in and out of your office all day long. You're on the field, uh -huh. you know, on the court watching the game, but you're also there to respond to any emergency uh, situations that might happen. So it's, yeah. it can be intense depending on, you know, the sport and, and the competition. You know, and I, I got a story. So first, first of all, this is going to be kind of before you ended up working at Wenatchee Valley College. So it was 2019, we're doing the Athletics Hall of Fame. Veronica comes to Wenatchee Valley College. It's her very, very first day. Uh, she's got a big smile on her face. She's, she's, a, she's got plenty of hands to help. And she's just asking me, like, hey, how can I help? So what we're doing, we're doing the Athletics Hall of Fame. There's probably about 400 or 500 individuals. We're doing a full course meal. We're doing a live auction. We're doing a silent auction. And all of a sudden, Veronica just comes in, big smile on her face, trying to help out. And that was her first day. And I feel like she, since then, I, she, what she wanted to do and just help. And like when she's at campus, she is always just trying to help. Like this girl is grinding every single day in the training room, running around, you know, giving treatments left and right. And not only that, so the, the thing that's uh, different about athletic trainers is not only do they have to show up during business hours, but they also have weekends, long nights, traveling with the teams, so you are grindy. Yeah. Luckily in our conference, um, you know, we have enough athletic trainers at every school. We don't travel for in-season away competitions. Um, there's kind of too many. I would, I would be gone too often if that were the case. Yeah. Um, so when Walla Walla comes to Wenatchee for a competition, I am responsible for their student athletes. Um, so doing their pre-practice treatment, taping, that kind of thing, you know, and then making sure that if emergency or catastrophic injuries happen to them, I'm there to respond for them as well, just like I would for our Wenatchee student athletes. So I don't travel as much as some other conferences, but that doesn't mean the grind is lessened or, you know, oh, yeah. it just changes. It just shifts and. um, Definitely. Sometimes it means, you know, if all my teams are traveling, I get the weekend off. And sometimes it means, you know, we have some weekend practices or, or something going on, or we have our, um, you know, uh, our auction. And, <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know, we're spending yeah. our week getting ready for the auction. So, yeah. No, it, it's been awesome to get to know you on campus. And I know you're doing amazing stuff. And uh, my next question is, how did you get started within athletic training? Was there like who introduced you to this area? Was there something that kind of influenced you in that right direction? I think um, mostly the, the, the classes I was exposed to at Central ex were the ones that really were like, hey, this is athletic training as a profession. Mm -hmm. But there were different things in my life that looking back now, I'm like, oh, that was you know, gearing me up or prepping me for, for this profession. I'm the youngest of five girls. All four of my sisters were athletes. I grew up on the sidelines. I was, you know, they were volleyball players and softball players and soccer players and marching band and track athletes. And I was always at their competitions, you know, toting around my mom <laughs> and just following her to wherever she went. And then my dad, later in my life, coached Little League, even though he had no sons, coached a Little League baseball team for a number of years, and I was his bookkeeper. So I learned baseball and how to take books through Little League, and I loved being in the dugout. You know, I'm in high school, and these kids are 10, 11, 12, or however, however old they were, and I'm a part of this team, right, doing something with the team, and I'm like, this is fun, and, uh -huh. and, um, and then – kind of tragedy struck in my family, right? And my sister was in this horrible car accident, which she survived. Um, 
but suffered traumatic brain injury. And, and that was the first time I was exposed to real like physical therapy, rehab, the medical world, you know, and it was fascinating. And I think all of those things really wove together to put me in a position to be at Central to say, hey, these are the classes, these, this, there's a profession in something like this that can take your love for sports and, and take your competition drive and, and take that energy you have, but also that passion to help people and to rehab the human body because the human body was fascinating to me after I learned what was going on with my sister and how she was recovering. And, um, and then I also included in the interview, it was the cadaver lab at central that really was like, okay, this is, I can get into humans and how they work <laughs> and how they can heal and how they can use food to manipulate their performance and how they can, you know, dedicate this amount of training to get this process. And it can come down to math. You know, like we can figure out what's going on with numbers. And I was hooked. I mean, it was, that was it. It was like athletic training is for me. I, it was classes I could take. They were easy. You know, I, I mentioned to you, it was my first 3.0. I was smart at it yeah. um, on paper and that was it. it. You couldn't stop me. Man, that's awesome. And like I said, since we went to Central together, I'm pretty sure I saw you in exercise science. So I'm an exercise uh, science clinical physiology major. So I'm sure I saw you in those classes grinding away. Um, and that, that's, you know, that, that story that you mentioned about being on the sideline, you know, keeping the scorebook for baseball. Uh, I mean, you, you, were, you said that you were born on the sidelines. You had older siblings you just want to be a part of a team and now you're a part of a bigger team because now you're collaborating with all the different uh, departments men's and women's sports also working with other community colleges traveling with the teams when it goes into postseason so that's um i mean i think that's a, a true calling for what you what you experience as such a young individual and now it's and now it's your profession yeah a, and i've uh, been lucky yeah, you, you, you're one of the lucky ones, let me tell you. And I, just a, a quick little tidbit, back during my initial years at Central, I wanted to be an athletic trainer as well. Hey. I know. Should have gone through with it. People didn't know that one. So what's your, what's your most vivid memory from your childhood that has connected you uh, to athletic training? Is there something that kind of sparked your interest or maybe something funny that happened to you that, basically it's just kind of like a something that makes you chuckle in the back of your mind yeah well definitely the things I just mentioned you know growing up on the sidelines and and keeping books you know my dad actually claims a lot of it was me that introduced you to a profession in athletics uh -huh. just because I worked for his little league but um it it was really getting hurt when I was little and not receiving the care that I kind of innately knew was possible. You know, I would get hurt and I would scrape my knee or I would, you know, fall and hit my head. And my mom had her alternative medicine ways of caring for me and, and not, not to put my mom out there, but she's a tough woman and she's not going to see some little scrape and she's taking care of four other kids and she was getting her master's degree actually while I was growing up. And so like my mom was busy, like she didn't have time for my knee scrape. Right. <laughs> she's a go -getter. Um, but I do remember me and my friend one summer, we decided we wanted to run into each other with a big giant blew up ball, bouncy ball between us, you know, just kind of this, this experiment, what would happen. Oh, totally. <laughs> And what happened was we smacked right into each other and <laughs> I bit my lip and this tooth ended up poking through the tip of my lip and my friend freaked out because she could see my white tooth through my lip. And I, you know, it was like, oh man, this is going to require some emergency situation. We're going to, you know, I had, I had smashed my finger in a car door once actually um, and I don't know if this was before or after that, but my mom took me to the hospital for that because we thought maybe it was broken. Yeah. So here I am thinking my mom might take me to the hospital for my tooth poking through my lip because, I mean, that makes a little bit of sense. Yeah. And I run inside and I'm like, mom, I'm, I'm bleeding my tooth. And she's like, oh, and pulls my lip up, and pulls it off and I feel it. 
and she's like, oh, you're fine. Pinches my lip. And I mean, you could barely tell there was a cut in my lip. And I was just like, you know, I thought that required a stitch. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm sure you face this every day, um, you know, in the athletic training room, athletes coming in saying, hey, something catastrophic happened to me. I need X, Y, Z treatment. And you're saying, hey, no, put a Band-Aid on it. You're okay. We're just going to give you an ice bath and you're going to be rough. You're going to be playing tomorrow. Yeah, there's something amazing about kind of just cleaning up the wound and really yeah. looking at it and peeling back the, you know, the parts that are damaged and getting rid of it and just seeing it for its raw self and being like, ah, it's really not that bad. Let's just put some ointment and, and check in on it in a couple of days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, that's, I, I, it's, it's great to, to hear like, basically your journey and like what influenced you to your professions. And my next, my next question is like, what was your biggest setback? I mean, did you have any obstacles along the way throughout your athletic training career? If it was, if you did, what was it? Um, yeah, I definitely faced a few setbacks. Um, you know, there were a number of minor setbacks getting into grad school. It wasn't just this paved path of, Oh, you went, I went directly from central to grad school. I mean, essentially I did, it was 11 months span in between. Um, but I was waitlisted. I was waitlisted to get accepted and, um, I was seventh on the waitlist. So I didn't really think there was a chance for me to get in. You know, they were only accepting 20 students out of, it was 120 applicants oh, wow. and, the cohort is small, and so I thought my chances were pretty much out the window. I applied for an AmeriCorps job that summer thinking I was going to have to do something else. And then I got a call saying, hey, there's a spot available for you if you want it. You know, you have three days to decide, and we'll need you to move here in, in four weeks. What, what um, was if, going on to your mind you decide. <laughs> Um. <sighs> I had an opportunity to do something really cool through this AmeriCorps job that I thought I was being redirected and called to. Um, but it, it was my dad that really reinforced like, Hey, you put in a lot of work to even get this application through the door. And now they're saying you got a chance, you know, you're going to shut that door and, and hope to reopen it in a year or two or whenever down the road. And so I knew that wasn't possible. I knew the type of student I was, you know, the energy I had at the time, it was now or never. I had, I had to take the athletic training opportunity. And, and even after I was accepted, Danny, I was conditionally accepted and required to take a class that none of my other classmates had to take because they didn't like the curriculum I learned at Central. They didn't think it was in-depth enough. Really? So they liked my application, but they, they, I know, I was like, oh, rude. <laughs> Central. Yeah. Um, so that was another barrier I had to face my first year. And then second year rolls around and winter, winter time is when um, all the second years start gearing up to apply for the BOC, the Board of Certification Exam, which is our national certifying board. It's 175 questions, it takes about three to four hours online, wow. and it has a 50% pass rate. But my program had a 100% pass rate at my school. Yeah. And it, my program's three years old. So for three years, 100% of the students on their first attempt wow. passed the VOC. Those are some impressive stats. So you mentally, mentally prepare yourself saying, hey, I'm going to pass this thing. You have to. <laughs> I mean, no, it's $300 no to take it. As a, as a broke college student, you're like, I have to pass this the first time, right? Uh -huh. Well, the, the first time you're able to take it is April of your second year. So a month before graduation, you get approved from your clinical director. You know, you're in the final home stretch of your education program. You're nearly there, essentially, like you can take the board and get potentially get certified before you graduate. So I was at this point in, in my cohort, we only had we went from 20 to 18 students. So we, two, we lost two students um, okay. in two years, dropped out <clears throat> or just left or whatever. But um, not lost as in passed away. I wanted to clarify that. <laughs> no, thanks for that. Uh, <laughs> um, so of the 18 of us, I think it was seven or eight of us that chose to take it in April, myself included, um, you know, the month before graduation. Uh -huh. And I didn't pass. And then one of my classmates who happened to be the only other person from the Pacific Northwest <laughs> <laughs> didn't didn't did pass they, at all. Did they go to Central? 
No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you. They were from Oregon, but it was like, we were known as like the Northwesterners. Everyone else is from California or Arizona or <clears throat> Chicago, Florida, mm -hmm. all over other than the Pacific Northwest. So um, that was pretty devastating. I mean, it, to be the first in program history to tarnish that 100% pass rate to go from 100% to I think like 96% or whatever um, was, was pretty devastating. I, I was sad, oh, <laughs> but I'm, I, I'm sure I was also in the midst of graduating and finishing finals. And, and I think that was at the time, my bigger priority, you know, I needed to pass my classes in order to get my degree or else the certification didn't matter. And, and it, school wasn't as easy as it was or school for me wasn't as easy as it was for my classmates. And so I always had to go the extra mile, put in the extra time ask the extra questions, take the extra notes, get the extra help. I mean, that was me all the time, all the way through. And so I think it probably wasn't a wise decision for me to take the exam before graduation. Um, so, uh, and it's only offered so many times a year. So you have, mm -hmm. you know, you only have so many shots at it <laughs> Yeah. In, in one calendar year. And, and graduation alone, uh, you're, there's so much prep work that goes into it it's a big stage in your life. There's a lot of transitions going on and to top it off and add a, another stressor to it, another stressor to the equation. I, I, I could see how it's almost over the top. So Yeah. My entire family was coming down to California. We were going to spend a week together, you know, and go to Disneyland and do all these things associated with me graduating. And it felt like a lot was writing. You know, I'm one of, like I, I mentioned before, my mom has her master's and I have a sister with the JD and so here I am kind of the baby of the family, you know, rounding up the degrees and it just, the, the, the week of graduation itself had an Im immense amount of pressure around it for sure. Oh yeah, I'm sure. So you ended up failing. <laughs> so you, over, you overcame it, you dealt with the loss, you probably realigned, you know, what you had to do. What was that next step? Did you take the test again, you know, a little bit down the road? Did you wait a yep. year? Nope. The next step was registration right away. Um, the next available test was in that July. Um, and I stayed with an athletic training mentor and his family. I ended up living with them for a month and a half while I kind of prepped. I didn't do, I didn't do a, good, a, a good job of prepping um, for the second attempt. But uh, that was what I was supposed to be doing. I was supposed to be prepping to, take, to retake the test in, in July. And or so, excuse me, end of June that, that year. So a month after graduation. Um, so since you didn't prep test. enough, I kind of know what the outcome was. July 1st, I found out no pass. So you took it for the first time, didn't pass. Take it for the second time, didn't pass. So at this point, world, uh, shattered. Guess, do world shattered, just looking at it from a health and fitness standpoint, you know, I, I can just see some individual losing a bunch of weight, gaining it back, losing a bunch of weight gaining it back. So just feeling defeated, just thinking, I can't do this. Like, what am I doing that's wrong? So at that point, you almost have to recollect yourself and say, Hey, I'm going to do this. We are over going to, we are going to overcome this obstacle. Like, what was going on through your mind at that point? So this is like the second time you're going for your third attempt. Yeah. Do you know any baseball players that just go over for games? <laughs> coming, coming from a baseball player, a baseball is such a mental sport. And there'd be times where if you're in a slump, I'd go two or three games without hitting a baseball. And then all of a sudden you end up going three for three, four for four, you know, tossing a home run around there. And all of a sudden you're on cloud nine, but then it's a, a repetitive cycle. And a lot of baseball, what it is, is just mental. And you hear about the stories that baseball pitchers can't throw strikes anymore. And then, and they're in the MLB. Yeah. There, there's self doubt. There's a lot of confidence issues throughout what they're going through at that time that they can't throw strikes anymore physically and mentally they can throw strikes all day, but somehow, some way, something mentally went on where they can't, they, they, they just can't hit the, they can't hit the catcher's glove. So go, I'll, I'll let you go on before I keep that's, on my rant with baseball. That's the, the best. If for any baseball players listening, I was a stellar defensive player. You know, I'm making the diving catches. I'm stealing home runs. I'm throwing down to second. I'm getting them out right. Like, I'm a stellar defensive player. But when it comes to me coming to the plate and hitting 
hitting a ball or hitting a home run, I couldn't do it. Game after game, I wasn't hitting the ball. And, and people were believed in me, you know, they saw my potential and they're talking me up and they're encouraging me to continue. But like, when you can't do the one thing on one side of it, that will unlock everything for you. It was, you know, it was debilitating. So, so here you go. It's your third attempt. You're up to the So place. after my second attempt, okay. I moved from California back to Washington. I was like, I, I can't, you know, be away from my family anymore. I was away for two years. It was hard enough. I went through all these things without them. And, and I just couldn't do it. I got to go home. I'll study. But, but the next available test wasn't until October. So I had to go from July, I had from July to October to study. And this time I did. I mean, it was, my parents supported me. They said, you know, lock yourself in, you can have this bedroom, you can have this office, like, what do you need <laughs> to study and get this over with? And so it was my full-time job for um, the first two months I was home, two and a half months. And, and around the fall, I started to go back to work part-time at the gym, at my home gym. I'm in my hometown that I work at. Wow. And, and yeah, then, that's... yeah, taking the test in October. And at the time, um, I was kind of working at Skagit Valley College simultaneously providing emergency care only for the soccer team because I wasn't certified yet. I wasn't able to be an athletic trainer. Um, and they basically said, you know, if you pass your test, like we're willing to hire you on for basketball season and, and kind of go from there and like, see what happens. So like, let us know. And, and I found out that December of 2013 that I passed um, on my third attempt. Wow. I bet you the, the weight that fell off your shoulders was just, astronomical you could finally breathe again you could probably smile and truly smile and say hey you know what it took me three tries but I'm I'm finally a licensed personal trainer or excuse me personal trainer <laughs> athletic trainer I, I certified athletic trainer certified athletic trainer I don't know why I said personal trainer which is a completely I could never be a personal trainer, <laughs> athletic trainer. <laughs> and it took you it took you not two attempts but three attempts and you finally nailed it so yeah. that is a huge accomplishment, and that is a big accomplishment in its in its own. But during the pre-interview, you're talking about there was a, there was another big accomplishment that kind of really solidified why you were choosing athle uh, athletic training. You want to just touch base on that? Um, on kind of what kept me going. Yeah. Yeah, so my second year of grad school, um, I was working with the men's soccer team at CBU. We had our lead sport our second year that we spent the entire season with. So from preseason to postseason, you're with this team, you're their athletic training student, you work under the athletic trainer, they're teaching you, you know, day by day, what happens, what do you do, right? So here... I am with men's soccer, the athletic trainer I'm under, his name is Charlie. And Charlie and I were, we just hit it off. He's like a older brother to me, essentially. You know, we work really well together. We can, you know, kind of communicate without communicating. We work off of each other and, and just got along really well. And this particular day, we, we were butting heads. Like we weren't getting along. We weren't listening to each other. We weren't communicating and we were repeating steps that didn't need to repeat. We had a seamless process to get game day ready. And this is what we were doing. And we, it was a mess that day. It was just kind of chaotic for us. It, and, and no one else knew that, but Charlie and I were just like, Oh, this isn't how we normally do things. You know, yeah. we set this up first, blah, blah, blah. Anyway. Um, because of that, he's riding the gator to get the AED, which is the automatic external, external defibrillator, right? The life saving yeah. machine. Uh -huh. um, and I'm walking across the field to get it. It's kept in this lockbox out at the field. So we're doing the same job at the same time, which is not normally how we do things. Uh -huh. And he looks over at me and kind of rolls his eyes and shakes his head. And I'm like, well, I didn't know you were going to get it. Like, you know? <laughs> and he gets stopped by one of the facilities um, men and then drives off. Like the guy jumps in the gator and drives off and I'm running after them. Like, where are you going with the AED? What happened? And 
we were called to the scene of an unconscious man on a bench and softball coaches were already activating EMS. And this was a fairly large man. And so, you know, in order to do anything to attempt to save his life, we knew we had to get him from the bench. He was kind of slumped on to the ground and it took five men to do that. Um, And as soon as he was on the ground, it was go time for Charlie and I, I mean, we just hooked him up to the AED and it delivered a shock and told us to start CPR and he said, you go to breaths, I'll do chest compressions because this is a large individual. And we did about five or six rounds of um, maybe seven rounds of CPR before EMS took over. When they got there, they relieved him right away because he was already sweating. Um, and then relieved me with the once they bagged him. Um, so you want me to keep going? Yeah, no. And, and the reason why I was bringing that up is I just, so this is before you're an athletic trainer. I felt like this story was so powerful during the pre-interview just because here you are, um, you're, you're in grad school or, you know, you're becoming an uh, athletic trainer. Yes. And here you have this experience, right, where you're, you're with uh, Charlie and somebody passes, a, pretty much passes away and you revive them, you know. Uh, yeah. you're doing CPR, five to seven rounds of CPR, which I don't just, so I don't think a lot of people know how many, how long a round is. One round of CPR is legitimately about 30 seconds or more. And you are ex- physically exerting yourself. Your heart rate's getting elevated. Your internal temperature is rising. You're starting to sweat. You're starting to breathe a little bit harder and throw some adrenaline on top of that. So this was kind of like one of those moments that when you mentioned during the pre-interview that kind of like was one of those things that you knew that this was your calling. You knew that you were, um, were there to serve individuals. So it's like everything you experienced from your childhood, you know, being on the sidelines with your dad, you know, to assisting your sisters or assisting your siblings, I should say. And then going through this experience, kind of saying, Hey, this is what I'm meant to do. This is how I'm meant to serve people. Like I, I can really make an impact in, indiv- in individuals' lives lives by treating them for athletics and not only that for EMS support I mean like you you handle a lot of emergency situations on and off the court and this one had to be a bystander so this individual um, you mentioned during the pre-interview that he, he did revive and he had the last three days to spend with his family and being a big family man myself having three days to spend with my dad would be the would be the one thing that I would want just to be by his side um, and just and just as just to say thank you for everything you've done so that was an amazing story and also you mentioned that you have a huge motivational factor that really drives your day to day again our pre interview was so amazing we connected really well and I just kind of want to give light to what motivates you day day to day and keeps you uh, keeps you going. Um. I think you're alluding to my sister. Uh, I, I am. I thought that was, I mean, it's such an amazing story. And I just, I feel like you should share it with everybody. Um, yeah, uh, well, I kind of already mentioned it. But yeah, my I was 17 when my sister got in, in a horrible car accident, single car accident. She, you know, overcorrected her 85 Bronco on the 101 freeway in Southern California on the 4th of July in 2005. And it, it, brought everything to a halt, you know, essentially changed our lives forever. And it brought us into a world that we didn't know even existed as a family, you know, emergency care for one, you know, strangers that took care of her to trauma, trauma, you know, level one trauma care, um, brain injury care, rehab care, you know, all of these things, long-term facility care, air ambulances, you know, that took care of her and brought her from where she was to where she is. And just her stamina through all of that, her continued will to survive, despite the odds, you know, she wasn't supposed to make it past 24 hours. And they had to remove um, her cranial flat, her cranial bone, to allow her brain to swell to max capacity and come back down right on its own, you know, persevered through that, 
And just every single day shows me that no matter the circumstance, you can have a smile on your face and enjoy where you're at and, you know, understand that you're given what you're given for a reason. Um, and, and all else will be taken care of. You know, the kind of the rest of life isn't for you to figure out. You know, you'll figure it out along the way, along the journey. My sister would always say, peace be the journey. You know, she would chase a butterfly up a mountain, regardless of her, you know, 7 p.m. dinner reservation, because that's what she was called to do. And um, definitely pushes me to live that life just like her, you know, even though she can't and kind of do it for her. You know, we have this kind of running... um, mantra in our family like we run for those who can't you know my sister can't run she can't just go out on a run anymore which she loved to do and so we take that on for her you know we run we run because she can't so no that's no thanks for sharing that veronica that was um i know you told me that story during the pre-interview oh look at her it's hard to see with the background. Yeah, no. Um, when you told me that story, I feel like that's that's huge. Um, and basically, just to live every day to its absolute fullest. And I can I can honestly look at you right now and your footprint at WVC. You're currently doing that. The way that you serve athletes, the way that you serve coaches, the entire athletic department, but not just athletics, but the campus as a whole. Right now, you're making a lateral move and working with uh, Campus Life. So you're working within our department, which you're, you're just, you're a true blessing. You're a true asset to the team. So I think right now, what motivates you and that story is like you're currently doing it every single day. So I just want to say thanks. It's a pleasure to be working with you and getting to know you. And I'm so jacked on this interview. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that a lot of people get a lot out of this um, just because your whole life story of your career of being an athletic trainer and like the ups and the downs and what you had to deal with and your sister, I mean, that's tragic. Um, you know, having someone that you care about the most legitimately change their life and it's upside down and you, not only you, but your entire family have to pivot with that. Um, that that's a huge change in your life. And I just wanted to say, um, if you need anything, I, I just want to sincerely say, Hey, I, I'm a friend. Uh, feel free to reach out. Um, and that's kind, Danny. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's, uh, that's my duty. My duty is to, to be there for others. And, um, you know, this has been an amazing podcast and basically if anybody has any questions, um, can they reach out? If so, where can they reach you? Um, if they want to know a little bit more about your past or a little bit more about athletic training on how they can get involved with athletic training, how do, how do they get a hold of you? Yes. Um, I have a athletic training Instagram for Wenatchee Valley. It's WVC athletic training, all one word on Instagram. Um, you can go ahead and follow me there and, and DM me any questions you might have or email me at my work email, which is vperez at wvc.edu. Awesome. And then if individuals want to get involved with athletic training, where, where should they go? Oh man, they definitely should. Um, they can contact me. They can check out the NATA website. NATA is our National Athletic Training Association, kind of our, our national membership organization that has a lot of links and, and resources on their websites for prospective athletic trainers, current athletic trainers, um, and kind of a um, laid back approach to what athletic training might be, you know, um, if you're interested in, in checking it out. But a more kind of hard, fast approach would be to visit the Katie website. Katie is C-A-A-T-E, which is the Commission for Accreditation for Athletic Training Education Programs, I think. Did I get that right? Yes. I think so. We'll, um, just... we'll drop the link. <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry. You'll get that link. But um, the Katie website can filter all of the current – athletic training education programs in the country, where they're located, what their uh, standing is, if they're active, if they're in kind of a re-accreditation process, if they're no longer active, who the contact um, person is for each of those programs, the clinical directors, those kinds of things, how to apply links to all the schools 
um, through their website. So you can kind of filter, you know, what your preference is and find a school for you. Yeah, perfect. And we're going to drop the links below. Thanks again. V, you've been a pleasure to talk to. Thanks, I, Danny. I'm, you I'm, too. I'm so excited to launch this interview. Everybody, if you have Same. any questions, feel free to reach out to V. Until next time, thanks again for tuning in. This is the Rec Center Podcast. I'm your host, Danny Z. Y'all have Good a night. Day. Thanks again for joining everyone. This is Danny Zavala, your host on the Rec Center Podcast, the hottest podcast here in Central Washington, bringing you amazing individuals doing amazing things within health and wellness. We are here every Tuesday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Be sure to like, share, or comment down below. Subscribe to our channel and let's have some fun, baby.